Good morning. As chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, in accordance with House Rule 67 and the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. This is a revenue work session. Please note that there is no physical location for members of the public to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting to the Zoom electronic meeting platform and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been made available in the House calendar and through the electronic calendar on the general court website. The notice for this meeting complies with House Rules RSA 91A. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should call 271-3600 or email hcs at lake.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. I want to introduce the staff that's on the meeting assisting us, Christopher Shea and Jennifer Four. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call of attendance. When each member states they're present, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Representative Bernstein, could you take the membership of the Ways and Means Committee? Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Uh, today is March 31st, 2021. It is 9.03 a.m., and I'd like to extend a warm Ways and Means welcome to our guests. Emily Brock, thank you for joining us today. And Senator Daniels, thank you. Let's begin roll call with Representative Patrick Abrami. Yeah, here in my home in Stratum, and my wife is in the house. Representative Mary Griffin. Representative Jordan Ollery. Home in Hudson, the wife is in the house. Representative Ober. Home in Hudson with six cats. Incidentally, yesterday, one of the cats was outdoors. So during roll call, there were only five. Now there are six. I thought something smelled fishy there yesterday. <laughs> I'm glad they're all accounted for. Uh, <laughs> Representative Doucette. Red Doucette. Your clerk is Alan Burstein. I'm in my home office in beautiful Nottingham, New Hampshire. Representative Robert Elliott. Uh, here in Salem, New Hampshire, home of the first lottery, and uh, my wife is in the living room. Good morning. Representative John Janigian. Yes, I'm here in my home office in Salem, and my wife is somewhere in the house. Good morning. Representative Nunez. Good morning, Mr. Clerk. I am home alone at my home in Pelham. Representative Baxter. Good morning, Mr. Clerk. I'm home alone, but there's a very large and loud turkey surrounding my house. So if you hear any noises, it's from the turkey. <laughs> Representative Walter Spilsbury. Good morning. Home alone in Charlestown. Good morning. Representative Tudor. Home in Northwood, wife and grandkids are upstairs. Morning. Representative Almy. Home alone in Lebanon. Representative Ames. I'm here in Jaffrey, alone in my office. Representative Southworth. Here alone in Dover. Representative Malloy. Here alone in Greenland. Representative Thomas Schomburg. Representative Schomburg is in London in his truck by himself. Good morning. Representative Edith Tucker. I'm home alone in Randolph. Representative Jenny Gomarlo. Representative is in Swansea by herself, but my husband somewhere. <laughs> Representative Tom Lofman. Representative Lofman. Representative Amanda Gorg. Good morning. I am present and alone. Representative Mary Hacken Phillips. Good morning. I am present from uh, Hanover alone. Representative James Murphy. Representative Murphy. Representative Chairman Norman Major. Good morning. I'm in my home office in Plasto. My wife is in the house. Good morning, Mr. Chair. There are 20 members present. Four members are unaccounted for. 
Thank you, Representative. I believe Representative Murphy was on, said he would be late. Thank you, Representative Elmy. As you all know, we have the president has signed the latest stimulus package, $1.9 billion, and there'll be money coming to the state, to the counties, to the towns and the cities. And we're all wondering what can we do with the money and what are the rules and regulations and so that we can uh, utilize the money the way it's supposed to be. We're fortunate that we have MIS Brock from the Government Finance Office Association. She's the director. Emily leads the coalition in advocacy efforts of the Public Finance Network in Washington, D.C. Her advocacy includes anticipating and responding to federal legislative and regulatory activities that impact the finance functions of state and local governments and public sectors entities, including tax reform, municipal security disclosure, and public pension and benefit issues. Emily also serves on the staff of GFOA's Debt Committee to develop the best practices that promote sound financial practices for local, state, and, and provincial governments. Prior to joining GFOA, Emily was a commercial bank relationship manager at a large national bank serving as the sole bank liaison for, for government and university clients. So Mrs. Emily Brock, uh, hopefully you're going to provide us lots and lots of valuable information. So it's all yours. I certainly strive to, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to chat about um, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. I'm, I'm going to refer to it from here on out as ARPA, as its acronym, ARPA. Kind of sounds like I'm barking a little bit, but no wildlife around my house just yet. Um, so I will be referring um, to that quite a bit. And also I will be sharing slides with you You've had, um, Ms. Floor was um, nice enough to distribute these slides to you. I'm certainly happy to provide any more um, information around uh, ARPA that might be helpful for you beyond, of course, this, um, the, the, this time with us uh, today, time we have together today. So I'm going to share my screen. Before you start, uh, yes, sir. joining us is Senator Bob Geider, who is chairman of the Senate Ways and Means Committee. Lovely. Thank you so much for joining. Um, so let me, um, as I'm sharing my screen, I'm going to put it on presenter mode. Um, now, I, I wanted to, to launch into ARPA, but I also wanted to lay a little bit of groundwork um, for getting us to where we are today. As we know, uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris's um, uh, 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 our American Rescue Plan um, came on the tails of some other stimulus legislation that happened during the Trump administration. And so some of your cities and towns may actually have uh, some uh, derivative effects from previously enacted legislation that I thought maybe it'd be good to talk about just for a quick moment. And this is um, specifically, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna move beyond the CARES Act. The CARES Act passed Congress last year on March 23rd, was enacted on March 23rd, and there was coronavirus relief funds that were distributed as um, the, the CARES Act was passed. Of course, now there are there is an extension on the coronavirus relief funds that kind of leads us into today. But also at the end of last year, there was an omnibus plan that passed, and it's called the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act. And if, if you recall, that actually is an extension of the omnibus. So it was the budget that had to pass last year um, uh, in, in Washington. But in addition, there was a 900 uh, 
$8 billion stimulus uh, plan that was attached to that. And some of those things um, are actually relevant for your cities, counties, and towns, you know, but also the state of New Hampshire. So um, in, the, in, in, the, in the plan that passed at the end of last year, the Coronavirus Relief Fund funds were, were extended. So basically you can spend those CRF funds beyond December 31st, 2021. Another thing that's really important for your cities um, and your counties is an extension and a re-up of what we call the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. So $25 billion um, for cities and counties of, 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 above a certain threshold in population will receive $25 billion for emergency rental assistance. Um, in addition, there was education stabilization, and as we all know, um, an extension of unemployment insurance. Another thing that's probably less well known that, um, that a lot of my membership is, is asking about right now is there was a, a low income utility assistance program that was in that act as well. $638 million that's kind of sitting right now with the um, Department of Health and Human Services or HHS. Um, and they're still crafting a plan about what are, that, what are, what are the parameters there? How do low income qualified uh, recipients apply for that? But the most important thing to your cities, counties and towns is that that utility assistance could go directly to your, um, your, your water programs um, or others. So, so that's an important part of kind of what we're dealing now, right now with the emergency, with, with ARPA, is that there's still some legacy or derivative effects of the previous two, um, the previous two stimulus plans that passed in the Trump administration. And so we're still kind of massaging that information out for our membership so they know where that money is coming from and where it, it possibly can go. Um, so let's jump right into it. The American Rescue Plan of 2021 passed on March 11th, 2021. It was signed by uh, President Biden. Um, what happens in, um, in, in, in federal legislative efforts is that um, there's, there's a timing or a clock that's set in legislation that says post enactment, then uh, there's a clock that starts for distribution of those funds. So in the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, signed on March 11th, they have 60 days post enactment to distribute those funds. Um, and, and the act itself is very, very large. We all know that um, it's nearly $2 trillion. A very important critical feature, I think, of it is that it was able to pass with relative ease, but at very narrow margin. So um, it was only the Democrats in the Senate that voted for the bill, but nevertheless, they used a budget tool called reconciliation that allowed for them to pass that bill at a very narrow margin. And um, it was quickly funded and here we are. So we're waiting right now during the 60 days post enactment period to understand what the distribution of the funds look like. Um, of that $1.9 trillion, uh, $350 billion is dedicated to states and local governments. As you all know, the state portion of the funding is $195 billion. And in the act, there is a minimum threshold distributed equally among the 50 states. So the 50 states get at least $500 million and the District of Columbia gets 1.25 billion. Now the remaining amount will be distributed according to a formula that takes into account each share of state, each, each state's share of the national figure of unemployed individuals. Now, probably we're aware um, so, uh, in early March, there was a fair amount of conversations between governors um, and the administration to say, why are we distributing it according to unemployed individuals as opposed to population? Um, and most of those states uh, were states that had um, had local and regional economies that could withstand the pandemic. So they were saying, it's not fair. We, we would prefer for it to be um, according to population. But nevertheless, the way that the 
final bill was wrote, written out. Um, uh, it is actually based on unemployed individuals uh, compared to the national share of unemployed individuals. Um, now, the one of the most important things about um, making sure that the money gets to where it needs to be is that the bill has written into it um, a certification process. Um, so for states, for example, um, each state has to certify, like for example, New Hampshire has to certify to the United States Treasury that they will be using that $1.9 billion that they've been allocated. Same thing goes for um, communities, for cities and counties. Each one of those jurisdictions has to certify with the United States Treasury that they will be using those funds. That's an important part because there currently are a lot of GFOA members, I can tell you that, who are asking me, when can we certify? How do we certify? Where do we, where do we send the letter? Um, everybody's ready to certify for their funding, but yet um, there really hasn't been anything yet determining um, exactly what communities are going to be getting. Um, this is a really very interesting part of a sort of sort of a speed bump along the way. And the speed bump is, of course, that you can't certify if you don't know what you can spend the money on. <laughs> so the, there's a lot of carts and there's a lot of horses. So we're trying to make sure that we situate it so that communities understand um, what they can spend the money on. Another element of section 602 of 9901, so this is the state distribution section that I thought was very interesting, is that in the bill uh, the uh, Congress passed, they give the Secretary of the Treasury, so Secretary Yellen, the authority to split payments to states. Um, she has the authority to distribute the first 50% in the first year. And if she so decides, she can split that in half and create it another payment, 50% of, of the state's allocation a year later. Um, though reading it, and of course, talking with the United States Treasury and talking with the White House, we don't get the sense that Secretary Yellen intends to do that for the state. Um, we think that that was written into the bill simply to mirror the um, local distribution, the way that the local distribution acts. Um, but we don't think that Secretary Yellen will split those payments. But nevertheless, I think you all should be aware that the legislative text gives Secretary Yellen permission to split those payments 12 months apart. Um, one of the really important things about this is that um, ab about the legislation itself is that uh, there is a specific clause for recruitment of proceeds, um, just like in the coronavirus relief fund. In this one, they say, should you spend the money outside of the eligible expenditures articulated in the bill, then the United States Treasury has the authority to recoup those funds. So another really important critical feature, it's not that the Treasury is kind of releasing those funds and not auditing. There will be a specific and a measured approach to auditing those funds, how states are spending them, how local governments are spending them. And that's an important feature of the legislative text. I want to move on to section 603. So this section 603 is an articulation of how cities and counties will be getting their money. Um, so uh, obviously, as you know, states are going to certify for that $195 million. They will get a distribution of the proceeds no later than 60 days post enactment. Now, the derivative of the $350 billion, the part that not that is not going to the states, is $130 billion, 130.4. And it's it's distributed equally between cities and counties. So cities will get $65 billion and counties will get $65 billion. I'm gonna go to counties first, the distribution to the county source, because it's actually easier. <laughs> the way that they've written uh, counties into the bill is that all counties across the United States will receive $65 billion and the distribution of it is based on the community development block grant formula for counties. 
And if they are not entitlement counties, that is they are not CDBG recipients, they will receive a distribution based on the population. And in the, in the legislative text, Congress was really careful to say, you know what, um, if you do have a CDBG formula, you fall in a CDBG formula, but yet we look at your population and your population puts you at a larger amount than your CDBG share, your pro rata share is greater than your CDBG share, we'll, grow with, we'll go with the greater of the two. And so that's a relatively easy um, figure because if you look at the counties across, the country, I think there are 84,000 counties across the country, or I'm sorry, 8,400 counties across the country. Um, and so the distribution is relatively easy. Cities get a little bit more complicated because there are cities, uh, there are a substantial amount of cities that are not CDBG recipients. And so what Congress has done is they said, um, the larger of the counties, so we're taking that $65 billion, and for the larger of the cities, those that have a population over 50,000, they'll receive $45.5 billion according to their CDBG allocation. So a very easy number that they can pluck from the Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, they can just pull out that CDBG formula and use that formula to distribute that $45.5 billion. It's a little bit more complicated when we talk about towns in smaller cities whose population is underneath that 50,000 threshold. I have to be very clear here though. Um, 50,000 in population is not necessarily a bright line for CDBG recipients. A town can be 45,000 in population and still be a CDBG recipient. So if that city or town is a CDBG recipient, they will be in that first formula. They'll get $45.5 billion. If they are not, then they will receive a distribution uh, based on their population share. And I would imagine in New Hampshire, there's probably a fair amount of jurisdictions that fall in that category. One of the most important elements of this middle bullet point, the smaller jurisdictions, I think for you in particular, is that those monies will flow through the state. In the legislative text, they said that money that is reserved for those smaller jurisdictions will flow through the state. The state will get the allocation for the smaller jurisdictions and then the state will be responsible for distribution of those funds to the smaller jurisdictions. They also put another restriction on it. They say, state, you must take that money and distribute it to the smaller jurisdictions. But in addition, qualifier is, that you can't give more than 75% of their most recent budget. And that's baffled a fair amount of states. I've got to be honest with you. I'm talking with, you know, obviously, uh, Virginia, Wisconsin, uh, uh, Nebraska, Texas. A lot of the states across the country don't necessarily collect their local community's budget. And so in order to ensure that the distribution does not exceed 75% of the smaller community's most recent budget, that will require some homework, some extra work on behalf of the states to ensure that the distribution to those smaller communities does not exceed 75% of their most recent budget. And, and, and another important thing, of course, is that um, there is a time parameter based on this. Uh, so in the legislative text, obviously you have, so March 11th, the president signed the bill. He has 60 days to distribute the funds, but because states are responsible for distributing the money to those smaller jurisdictions, there's actually another clock that's built into the legislation. So. 60 days post enactment and then inside the legislative text they say for states that have to redistribute to smaller jurisdictions you have another 30 days to make that happen they're giving you another 30 days so technically 90 days post march 11th then additionally in the legislative text 
they've given you the opportunity to appeal for more time. So you have two different periods of time where you can appeal for another 30 days in order to get those funds out. And the appeal basically is the state, the state executive uh, calling, <laughs> calling the treasury saying, we need another 60 days and here's why we need another, need another 30 days and another 30 days, we need another 60 days to distribute these funds. And it's very likely, uh, what I anticipate from other states certainly, it's very likely that they will be trying to make, ensure that they comply with the legislative um, text um, condition that the distribution cannot exceed 75% of their most recent budget. Okay, so that's just a really important qualifier for states. Um, one, one thing that my members have brought up to me, of course, is um, with the Single Audit Act, uh, the smaller communities are wondering if, if in fact they are sub-recipients of the state and therefore have to comply with the state requirements as opposed to the local requirements. So we're, we're talking with Treasury about that right now. For Section 603, uh, which is again, the distribution to the localities, the legislative text is very specific. Payments to local governments will absolutely be made in two tranches. So unlike the state, where they've said Secretary Yellen has the option of sending out the money in two tranches. In the local government section, they're very clear to say that payments to local governments will be made in two tranches by the United States Treasury. The first half, those localities will get 60 days after enactment, and the second half will come exactly one year later. So if let's say they um, um, are able to distribute the funds by May 11th, uh, local governments will receive their first tranche on May 11th, 2021, and their second tranche on May 11th, 2022. So important sort of qualifying factors of when the money goes out, the timing, um, and the parameters on those monies um, is definitely articulated in the legislative text. Now, what's a little bit more ambiguous, and I'm going to sit on this slide for just a minute, is how uh, jurisdictions can spend the money. And as I understand it, this conversation today is to try to dig to the bottom of that. Um, so, so let me let me first uh, talk about each one of the eligible uses. And eligible use A looks very familiar to coronavirus relief fund recipients. So, in the CARES Act, the CRF funds, they were very um, very specific about the fact that you could only use the money to respond to public health emergency with respect to COVID-19. So the Coronavirus Relief Fund or the CRF funds were subject to that restriction. But in this legislation, they take that restriction and then they expand on it substantially. Um, one thing that they do in eligible use A, and, I, and I'll, I'll point it out to you in line two of the first bullet, they add on three words or its negative economic impacts. So that is something that's totally different than the CARES Act. Negative economic impacts um, could be interpreted many different ways, but a lot of your finance officers who are my members, um, you know, obviously if this is a federal grant, we wanna make sure that we're using the money according to the to legislative intent. So what we need is a better definition of the negative economic impacts of the public health emergency. For example, some of my jurisdictions have called and said, well, what if we had deferred maintenance during COVID-19 and we need to patch up roadways? Is that a negative economic impact of the public health emergency? Um, we do not have any more definition on what negative economic impacts means but if you look at the rest of the eligible use A, they give you an idea. Maybe you're thinking about uh, assistance to small businesses. That was certainly something that the Coronavirus Relief Fund was being used for. What about assistance to nonprofit or impacted industries and areas that depend on tourism and hospitality revenues? So they give you an idea in the rest of that eligible use A that, that, that that possibly some negative economic impacts could be that, but it's not limited to that. So a very important element of eligible use A. In eligible use B, this is entirely new, something totally different from the coronavirus relief fund. What an eligible use B is saying 
is that states and local governments can use the ARPA funds to respond to workers performing essential work during the COVID-19 emergency. And the states and local governments can provide them premium pay to eligible workers. What's a great thing about this clause is that there's a lot of definitions of each one of these words inside of the legislative text. So we have a little bit more understanding in eligible use B of what qualifies. So first of all, they define the word premium pay. They say, you can provide up to $13 per hour additional pay uh, to these employees not to exceed $25,000 in the, ca in the calendar year. Then they also define eligible workers. They say eligible workers are an employee of the state or local government who are deemed essential by the executive. So essentially, if we're talking about New Hampshire, it would be the executive of the state determines who is an eligible worker and who is not an eligible worker. I've talked to several communities across the country that uh, their executives, let's say it's a county administrator executive, who are saying, well, all of my employees performed essential work and all of them are eligible workers. Um, nowhere in the legislative text is that limiting. So you kind of think about that. If an executive determines that all of his or her employees are essential, that is absolutely allowed in this in the legislative text, given the parameters. So again, that's $13 per hour, not to exceed 25,000 for an eligible worker that's determined by the executive. For eligible use C, now this is a little bit more complicated, um, a little bit more complicated to measure at this point because we don't have a whole lot of definition in, in eligible use C. So what eligible use C is getting at before we start in the, in the words what it's getting at is it's saying a lot of communities across the country have lost revenue due to the pandemic. Now, for communities, that could mean, uh, for lots of communities across the country, it could mean sales taxes, it could mean property taxes, and it could mean income taxes. Obviously, New Hampshire is unique. Florida is unique in that there's no income tax. So there's, you know, some communities have one of th two of three of those. Some of them have all three. And many of them have, have had to dip into reserves in order to provide the vaccine or in order to provide for coronavirus, uh, the coronavirus pandemic to their communities. And so what Congress is telling us about eligible use C is that they're saying, you can claim that loss of revenue and use it for the provision of government services. So let's say the town of Emily has lost 10% of her sales tax revenue. Um, what I can do according to eligible UC is I can look at the loss that I incurred back in 2020 and I can account for that. Even though I booked the loss back in 2020, I can claim that as an eligible use in 2021. So if I had say an 8% reduction in my sales tax revenue collection, I could theoretically take 8% of that, those expected revenues and use that as an eligible use. Now it gets complicated. Let's say you have a community who um, owns and operates a, a municipal zoo. Obviously you haven't had revenue from that municipal zoo operations in quite some time because there hasn't been a community going there, paying revenues to get in. So there's, there's, been an, there's been an actual loss in an enterprise in your community, and that's the zoo. The question for eligible use C is, can I book that loss from the zoo and then recoup those funds and put them back into my general fund? In eligible use C, there's no, there doesn't appear to be any restrictions on the fact that you've lost revenue in one category and you can take that eligible use and put it in another category of the government. So there's a lot of conversation right now for communities saying, can I take a booked loss on my port or on my zoo or on an other um, enterprise of the government and then use that money to replenish my rainy day funds? So that's certainly a question for the treasury that we're hoping to get more clarity on in the future.
certainly within 60 days. The last eligible use category is very explicit. It's very, <laughs> it's almost painfully explicit. Um, what they say is, you can use this money, an eligible use of ARPA is that you can make necessary investments in water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure. For a lot of communities across the country, they're saying, well, that's kind of limiting. What if I have school repairs or HVAC systems that I need to, to, to do? What if there are uh, parks and recreation facilities that need upkeep? What if there's other capital projects that I need to invest in? Is, is eligible use D limiting my possibilities of using this money for capital improvements or capital plans? So, uh, I mean, I think for most of us, as we're looking at the eligible use category D, we're saying, well, that's a good suggestion, but where else can capital projects fit in these eligible uses? Could I conceivably use the loss of revenue in eligible use C and spend that on say a fire station? So I've booked a loss of the zoo. It happens to be the exact amount of money that I need for a police station. Could I use that? And then therefore I have those capital projects that I can take up, that I can use this money on, that will help me to both receive rescue and look forward to recovery. Um, so, but really quickly, let me touch on, so those, those are what you can spend the money on. They're also very explicit about two things that you cannot spend the money on. Cannot, uh, in the state section 602, you cannot be used to directly or indirectly offset tax reductions or delay a tax increase, which is very uh, complicating for a lot of states and their plans for this money. As you can imagine, if you're looking at all of those eligible use categories, they're easier in some cases for local governments to implement. For example, premium pay, easier for local governments to implement. Um, it, Eligible use A, the public health emergency and boots on the ground, that's, those are easier to implement for local governments. So you look at the restrictions and you say to yourself, okay, well, states actually, you know, there, there's a lot of things that states are trying to do to both keep up with the tax credits that were built into the current legislation, but also, yeah, you know, that's what states are. They, they are, they, they, they collect the taxes, they spend the taxes. This is, this is how states operate. And so when that restriction was put in at the last minute, there's a lot of states that kind of seized up and said, okay, uh, um, now I need a little bit more clarity on what I can spend the money on. And so um, a, a lot of state governors called Secretary Yellen and said, what exactly do you mean by that restriction? And what Secretary Yellen said, what she said was, you know, Funds are fungible. I think, I think there's a lot of people who have been using that term over the past two weeks, funds are fungible. And what she means is you can kind of take that money and put it elsewhere in the government, free up general fund revenue that then would allow you to directly or indirectly offset tax reductions or delay taxes. So um, she's kind of saying, don't take that pot of money and put it directly into tax reduction put it elsewhere in the government so that the government then using fund accounting can figure out sort of those big chess pieces and allow for the state to efficiently use their $195 billion uh, distribution. The other restriction that was very clear and was in there from the very beginning, both in the House bill and the Senate bill, was that funds cannot be deposited into any pension fund. And again, um, that, it's very explicit, that's, that's exactly in the ledge text, funds cannot be deposited into any pension funds. So in theory, um, it would be that you can't take the 1.9 trillion or a billion dollars, you can't take that and just put it directly over into the pension fund. But a lot of your local governments are looking at that restriction and saying, well, what if I wanted to cover payroll? Does that mean that I have to explicitly separate compensation from benefits and specifically for those who are earning pension benefits, do I have to explicitly separate the two? So we're asking treasury again for clarification on that. And the last restriction on the fund is that funding has to be um, available through and must be spent by the end of calendar year 2024. So the clock is ticking starting now 
through the end of 2024 to spend those funds. Um, recently, we got a call from the White House and the Treasury, and they said, um, <laughs> they said, do your members have any questions about the way that this money can be spent? And we said, yes, lots. <laughs> we have lots of questions. <laughs> And what they did is they sent us sort of categorically what they wanted to know. They were saying, um, okay, so do, do your people have any questions about the eligible use categories? Do you know what they want to spend it on already? And what have you learned from the coronavirus relief fund? And so a couple of, a couple of big categories, of course, uh, fall within that permissible use category. We want to make sure that when you're looking at revenue replacement, that you can look retroactively. Or if you're talking about premium pay, that you can look retroactively. One of the greatest challenges with the ledge text, the literal interpretation of the ledge text, is there's not very good interpretations of the covered period. Are we looking backwards? Are we looking forwards? If we are talking about revenue replacement, are we talking about revenue replacement in 2023? If so, what am I comparing that to? So a lot of questions for the treasury about, can you help us define what the covered periods are so we know how we can certify these funds? The other thing that we mentioned to treasury and, and the White House as we were talking to them is that the qualifications of the restrictions on the use of revenue, we really wanted for states to better understand what that meant directly or indirectly offset the tax increases. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to mention when talking with the treasury, um, we made it clear that there's a lot of urgency in our membership. A lot of folks are ready to certify those proceeds, but we don't have an idea about how they can certify the proceeds or what the eligible expenditures are. And so we asked treasury, is there any way to speed up or get us more information about specifically, maybe maybe examples of what the eligible uses are. Give us a couple examples so we can start building out those certifications. And what they told us, and I think it's important to share with you, is that they think that getting out the guidance might take the full 60 days, that they're not ready to put out the guidance yet on um, the ARPA funds. So we have to be patient in some ways, but also understand as we're talking with Treasury and as you all are talking with Treasury and as there's conversations happening, that I think Treasury is learning, that there's a lot of learning that has occurred since the use of the coronavirus relief funds. And we do, we do have a Treasury that's listening to our concerns. So I think that that's a really good sign here that we can teach them what's happening, how, what our concerns are, and that how they can clarify those eligible use of proceeds better. Giveaway uh, came together. Uh, my membership came together and said, "There's a lot of ambiguity in these funds, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of plans already being made." Um, so, your finance directors, your budget officers, your tax assessors and collectors, um, my, who are my members, came together and said, "Can we set up some principles, some core principles, for the finance officers having conversations with their elected?" And these are things that you probably have already thought about yourself and your committees. Um, certainly something that's um, being articulated every day in city and, and town and county councils. But the fact is um, these ARPA funds are temporary. They have to be spent by 2024. And so there are some communities across the country. I think what we're trying to do is sort of balance the logic of the fact that there are some communities that were significantly harder hit by the pandemic who had to dip into reserves. And so ensuring that those communities understand replenishment of reserves should be a high priority. And the reason for that is so that they can rebuild, that they can recover, that they can be rescued from the pandemic. So a, 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 a clear guidance from GFOA saying, make sure that you prioritize that replenishment of reserves. On the other hand, if you have money left over or if you didn't have to dip into reserves and you are thinking about either critical infrastructure or in a creation of new programs, we offered a couple of sort of cautionary statements. We said, if you're, if you're thinking about critical infrastructure, consider that you may already have a list. 
you may have a capital improvement plan or a structural budget that allows for investment in critical infrastructure, this would be a unique opportunity for you to be able to do that, to use those funds on that. Um, last but not least, a, a, cautionary, a cautionary statement to those who are thinking about programs or add-ons to programs is that if they do require an ongoing financial commitment, that's something that should be documented because you need to be able to sustain that program through 2024. If you use the grant funds to create a new program, consider that those are going to have to be ongoing concerns throughout and beyond that 2024 timeframe. The other thing we wanted to make sure that local jurisdictions understood and I think this is especially important for you all as, as you're thinking about the relationship between the state and the local governments. We wanted to get to the local government level and say, listen, local governments, states are going to have a lot of initiatives based on their, their receipt of these ARPA funds. So make sure there is that communication between the local government and the state government so everybody understands how those funds are being used. But it's not just state and local governments that are receiving ARPA rescue funds. There are PK-12, there's economic development, there's transportation money going out there. And so we told the local governments, you know, as you're considering and you're talking with, with your county councils and your town councils, consider that there may be other recipients in your community. And if you can partner or maybe even create cooperative spending programs, then you could augment the rescue on behalf of the community. So another consideration for local governments moving forward. And then last but not least, one thing we wanted to make sure that uh, GFOA members understood, and I, I think they have a very strong understanding of this, um, is, is sort of the concept of patience and time. Um, yes, the funds have to be spent by 2024, but also consider you have until 2024 and the local governments, as, as you all can see, local governments are particularly um, sort of staged because they have that two tranche distribution. They only get half the first year and they only get half the second year. So there's a natural governor built in to the local spending programs. So it, it, it allows for the finance director to say, hang on a second, should we solicit you know, um, information and feedback from our communities? Should we take a, a second to look at what the first tranche did and then reassess how we can utilize that second tranche before 2024? So that timing element was something that our membership thought was really important for local finance officers to have that conversation with their, uh, with their decision-making bodies. Um, those of course are, are sort of key things. Those, those aren't the only things. Um, one of the other major things of course that communities are thinking about is um, capital infrastructure and physical infrastructure and investment. And um, we just wanted for communities to better understand that structural integrity of what you're about to spend it on is a structural integrity that will lead to recovery. So again, just trying to make sure that, uh, that GFOA members and that communities across the country understand what this should be used for and how it should be used. Um, that's the conclusion of my written statement or my rather the PowerPoint slides as I have it, but I'm certainly happy to take questions. Well, thank you, Emily. That was excellent. It uh, raises a lot of questions, but also gives us more understanding of what's happening. So questions from the committee or uh, uh, joining senators. First is Representative Yuri. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've got a couple of questions on that. Um, previously, um, uh, what do you call it, critical workers had been defined by the Secretary of Treasury. Does the previous definition of who was a, uh, a critical worker go by the boards and there's now a new one being developed by the new Secretary of Treasury? So the definition of essential workers is yeah. now given to the executive of the entity. So the local government executive or the state government executive or tribal or territorial uh, or, or territory executive, you make the definition about who is performing the essential work 
and determine those eligible workers. That's a definition that was included in the legislative text. Well, to follow up on that, Ms. Brock. Um, yeah, follow up, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Previously, uh, banking institutions, uh, um, financial operations were considered essential workers. I don't think that a local uh, executive uh, understands the breadth and width of that uh, definition. Are, are banks no longer essential under this? That's correct. So essential workers are defined as workers of the state, local government, territory, or tribal government. So um, it would not extend. So if, for example, if a community is working with a contractor, for example, that's outside of the employment of the jurisdiction and so therefore can't be determined to be um, that, that ineligible for being the essential worker, having that definition. Okay. Uh, follow up again, Mr. Chair. I would like to get as many participants asking questions. One more follow-up. Okay. Um, this would be, for example, uh, uh, county nursing homes. Uh, here we have county nursing homes, which are operated by the uh, county governments, which the budget is set up by the representatives uh, in the county who are seated in the county and the uh, um, um, commissioners of the county. So could this money be used, for example, to uh, pay for air filtering systems that were installed and extra staff uh, and paying for sick leave and, and, and such like? So in, in terms of the employment of the individuals at the nursing facility, it does, it, 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 what really matters is how those nursing facilities are incorporated. If they, if they are a governmental entity, then they fall underneath the governmental entity classification. Um, and so therefore fall underneath the, the, um, the, the executive's definition. Um, so that executive then would make the determination whether it's of the county or of the state if they are performing essential work. Um, but with regard to, I think your second question, which is, let's say we need to revamp these um, infrastructure facilities. Um, is that an eligible expenditure listed in um, the eligible use categories A through D? So no, nursing facilities are not explicitly um, identified in subcategories A through D. However, on the other hand, if there was revenue loss or if there was specific expenditures occurred as a result of the pandemic, then those categories fall underneath eligible use category A. Those COVID-19 expenditures do fall within that eligible use category A. So that was what I would lean heavily on if you were considering infrastructure upkeep for things that, um, that, that, that were down, that were run down as a negative economic impact of COVID-19. So I think that falls squarely within eligible use category A. Thank so, you, it's very timely. Emily, how, how much time do you have? So, um, I, I have 30 more minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is going to be Patrick Abromney followed by Representative Almy, Senator Ryder and Representative Elliott. And one question and one follow-up, Representative Bromley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Brook. Uh, nice presentation. So my understanding is that uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen hasn't finalized her rules. But at the same time, the 60-day clock is ticking. I'm having trouble reconciling those. Uh, how, how, do, how, does, how do town, cities, the state, counties do that? There are a lot of um, plans being plans being made <laughs> without uh, official guidance out from the treasury yet. And what towns and cities and counties and states are are doing is they're interpreting the the, the literal interpretation of the legislative text. So they're starting to write plans based on the literal interpretation of the text. Of course, I think the most important point of our, our, uh, of our considerations piece for GFOA and our membership is to take a little bit of time. Um, one of the biggest challenges represented is that, um, you know, the 60 day clock is ticking. And what we fear is that the certification and the eligible uses come out at day 58. And then you have to scramble in two days to make a certification, get a plan together, 
and receive that money on day 60. Um, so that's why the urgency has been communicated to Treasury uh, Secretary Yellen. Um, and of course, I'd urge that um, that folks uh, provide I, her office as much as, as much information as she can in order to help create that guidance swiftly because our communities need that. Oh, just a quick follow up, Mr. Chair. Any any chance they realize that uh, they're boxing everybody in and that to to add to the sixty days? I think there is a lot of concern uh, 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 for both the recipients of ARPA and also for those folks inside Treasury pulling that information together. I think that there is um, uh, significant outreach and they're certainly trying to make sure that they work as quickly as they can to get that guidance out. Okay, thank you. Representative Elmy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, two things, just a quick follow up on that one. Is there any effort to get the Congress to pass something really quickly that would add another month or two uh, to that? So uh, we, and, and we have the 60 days yeah, end. yeah you know, asking Congress to like act within 60 days is, might be asking for an impossible feat, but um, we, we have been talking with uh, Senate Finance um, and with the Ways and Means Committee about the urgency here. And we've been, of course, sharing our information with Congress so they understand the National League of Cities, the National Association, uh, Council of State Governments, we're all kind of talking with Congress to make sure that they understand there's great urgency here and that anything that we can do to help speed up the process is much appreciated. Yeah, and, and as part of that, could you just tell me, when does the 60-day clock ring? So it started on March 11th and the 60 days will be done on May 11th. Thank you. And if, if I could have my follow up on um, is in eligible uses, it only refers to state territory or tribal government. Are you saying that somewhere else there isn't a definition that says that that also includes towns and counties and cities? So I, that's a great question. I, I feel like maybe you've read the text. So, so in section 602, that is the section. So subtitle M, section 9901, um, there is section 602 specifically refers to how states can spend their money. Section 603 is specifically how local governments spend their money. The restriction to directly or indirectly offset tax increases only shows up in section 602. It does not show up in section 603. So you do have a lot of local governments looking at that saying, well, the restriction is only for the states. It's not in the local government section. Um, so that, that, that I think is a curiosity. Um, and we certainly need some clarity from the treasury on that. If, if I could just get clarity, sections B and C only mention state territory or tribal government, but that does elsewhere in the text include the counties and towns. That's correct. That's correct. Yes. Yep. Uh, Senator Geiger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the presentation, uh, Ms. Brock. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, will there be a document that provides a, uh, a layout of the review of the timelines for distribution and the appeal process for local communities? Yes, I think Treasury was very specific when they were created the CARES Act fund, the Coronavirus Relief Fund of what money was owed to what entities. And then additionally, the sequences of audit that were required based on the receipt of those money. So um, what we learned from the Coronavirus Relief Fund is that the sequences of audit have to allow for states and local governments to get the information together electronically submit the information and for the treasury to process that information. So um, what we've asked is for timing and specific dates on when that audit will occur. Obviously the recoupment of funds will occur after the close. So December 31st, 2024, they're gonna make a determination that all of those funds were used for eligible use categories. And then that's when the recoupment of funds clock will start ticking. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the second question, if I may, Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, 
your slides. Will we, will we be able to uh, download a copy of your slide presentation? Yes, um, I, I, absolutely. I believe the staff of this committee can distribute that to you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Thank you very much. We've distributed that, but we'll, we just, we'll distribute it again. Okay, Representative Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Madam Brock, I want to thank you for your exhaustive report. You did a wonderful job. And my question was the same as the Senator's. Uh, where will we be able to get copies of this plan off of our computers? You, you're sending yes. something out? Okay, yes. that yep. was my question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to remind the members that this has been recorded. And so you'll be able to, uh, I'm going to show it to my county commissioners and to my local uh, offices of the selectmen and that because it's important to all of them. And we thank you, uh, Mrs. Brock. Okay, next is Representative Ames. Okay, thank you. And first, I just want to echo the uh, appreciation for your comprehensive report. Very helpful. Um, New Hampshire is in the process of uh, working through a budget, a, pro, a budget for the next two years. We call it the biennium, and um, that's a comprehensive budget that uh, that uh, has spending items that uh, depend on spending sources that are state revenue as well as federal revenue, and um, and so what we're going to get federally, of course, matters to the decision making. I'm aware of, I've read that Vermont has factored into their budget, they're working on it too, they're a little ahead of us, I think, um, an anticipated receipt of ARPA money. And um, I guess the appropriations related to that would be conditional on you know, the money coming through and on the guidance that we're all waiting for and so forth. Um, and it seems like an, a smart thing to do when we're talking about an estimated maybe $960 million. That's the number I've heard for New Hampshire. Um, it's a lot of money. We're a small state. And uh, so my question is uh, uh, whether other states are doing as I think Vermont is doing, um, what are sort of the limitations on doing something like that? Um, you know, that we could just leave it all to the executive. There's some feeling the legislature needs to be involved and that's how the appropriation process works. So uh, there's definitely a, uh, a desire, I think, I think probably all legislators on this call share in it to set up a, a process that uh, includes the full, um, all branches of government in making these decisions, not just the chief executive officer. So maybe you could speak to that. Um, thank you for the question, Representative. So um, s some states um, have uh, processes that are inclusive of all branches. Um, some states uh, do largely set um, appropriations conversations are in and around the executive and then the legislative the legis legislative body kind of concurs um, one of the biggest challenges I would say about these funds and to, to I think to your point here is that um, should are we accounting for these funds and um, it, with a with a decent understanding of how much we're going to get <laughs> um, so I think it's important to ensure that the Secretary of the Treasury, Yellen, um, that she gives us a, an understanding of exactly how much is going to the states so that the decision making that happens based on the biennium budget, which is happening right now in many states, almost all states and in counties where we don't know. So Secretary Yellen has been afforded the opportunity to split the money between two years. I don't think she's going to do that. But that's written into the legislative text. So that's maybe one thing that um, 
that uh, the executive and legislatures need to consider is the fact that maybe half of it will come now and half of it will come later. I think until we better understand exactly how that distribution is going to occur, um, it's, it's very important to be as inclusive in the decision making as you possibly can because of the abundance of opportunities that may be provided by the loose interpretations of the eligible use category. So um, I think, again, you have a, a significant amount of work ahead of you and, and not a whole lot of clarity. Um, so the more clarity that comes along, of course, we'll be pushing it out to our membership and, and, and I know CSG will be pushing it out to you all. Um, but just to be sure, it's important to not set the cart before the horse. Thank you. Um, I'm going to sneak a question in. Um, <clears throat> on the small jurisdictions where they say the funds should not exceed 75% of the most recent budget, and all, <clears throat> like in New Hampshire, the towns, when they handle their budget and have to raise the t local taxes, it deals with the municipal part, the school part, and the county part. Does this indicate it's just the municipal part at 75% or the total budget for that community? It says exactly what the ledge text says in, in the bullet point. So it says 75% of their budget, which uh, as you can imagine, Mr. Chairman, has created a lot of confusion across the country because are we talking about the general government or maybe just the general fund of the government? Or are we more inclusive? Like you said, if you have a PK-12 system and you have other enterprises that you're operating under, let's say you're operating a parking facility or something else, are we including all of those figures into the 75% of budget figure? Or are we just looking at general funds? So we've asked Treasury for clarity on that because Obviously, the more that you include in that budget figure, the better off for those smaller entities. But there's no clarity at, at this point. They just say 75% of budget. They don't say of what budget. So, um, so we don't know yet. Because right. in our most of our communities, 90% of our budget goes towards education. And, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Representative Nunes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Brock, for coming in to speak with us today. Uh, I, my, my question is a little bit more granular. I hope that, I hope that uh, I'm on a good track with this. Um, it's about the essential workers portion of, of what you were talking about. Uh, are the decisions about essential workers in, in these uh, appropriations, is this, is this only going to be made at our top executive level, or will this be made at the executive levels of all the different at the state, at the county, at the town, uh, because I think there were discrepancies in the past around the pandemic about what the governor said was essential and what the town said was essential. So there, I know that my town is going to ask me about this. Mm -hmm. um, so thankfully in the, in the legislation, um, because there's two different sections, section 602 deals with the state, section 603 deals with the local governments. There is um, the payment of essential workers in the state section, and then there's an additional payment of the premium pay in the local section as well. So the state executive will make a determinant of essential workers. The executive of the state will make a determination of the workers of the state in that section. Local governments have the authority. Their executive can determine their essential workers as well. So thank you. That cleared that up for me. Thank you very yep. much. Okay. Uh, Representative Al uh, Almy, followed by Representative Spilsbury. Representative Almy. Thank you. On um, I was <coughs> on I just wanted to <coughs> sorry, let uh, Ms. Brock uh, know that we are uh, in in New Hampshire in most of the towns, all of the towns, I think, and some of the cities, uh, the school district is totally independent from the municipal government. So does the, does the, do the school districts get a share of this? And if not, are they supposed to somehow um, 
be merged in this document and work together to figure out everything. <laughs> our, my school district is incredibly independent from our city government. I under, understood. So similar to Oregon, similar to Texas, those ISD programs are, are definitely um, a consideration here because the ISD, the reason that they are independent is because they have their own capital projects. They have their own systematic planning. Um, and there's a reason that they're ISD. So completely understand that, that separation there. Um, but, and I think this, this might muddy the water a little bit from uh, the chairman's question. Um, so if, if, the, if it is an independent school district uh, structure, but yet those schools, um, let's say they are funded by property taxes. So the property tax then right flows through the jurisdiction over to the operations of the K-12 system. The city then will have to determine the, the property tax decline um, as an eligible use category C, and then make a determination of whether or not that replenishment of that money could then spend over into the ISDs. But I would say um, in ARPA, there is an entirely separate section. I think it's $36 billion that's going to school systems. And it's through what's called the Education Stabilization Fund. So it's sep so so yes, schools are schools are a benefactor of the ARPA funds in a separate category than the three hundred fifty billion dollars we were talking about today. Uh, Representative Spillsbury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Brock, this has been extremely informative. I appreciate it uh, very much. Uh, obviously, we're focusing our attention here on the three hundred fifty billion dollars allocated to states, uh, a lot of mystery in the remaining uh, 1.9 trillion. So I'm focused particularly on my community's plans for a water interconnect project, about 4.6 million, and a broadband uh, infrastructure project, about 2.1 mil uh, million. And separately, my county's considering a major renovation of the uh, county run nursing home. So with those three projects in mind, water, broadband and nursing home, they all seem like they may benefit from some portion of this uh, pool of funds. What I'm interested in is, are you aware of other funds outside of this 365 that would be targeted specifically to that kind of project or should we expect we have to find the funds to support those from this pool only? Well, thinking about those three projects in particular, um, the, two, the first two, the broadband and the water program seem to fall squarely in LGBTQ category D of, the, uh, of these funds. Um, so, and, and then in addition, um, as, as, as I was discussing earlier, the. The, the nursing facility, if that is a negative economic impact of COVID-19, that is there was maybe rundown of the facility and you needed to upkeep the facility or create HVAC, um, all of those things then would, ca would categorically be an eligible use category A. Now, on the other hand, they are unique programs. So broadband um, in and of itself is, um, it is explicitly listed in these proceeds and it is not explicitly listed elsewhere in ARPA. Water though is a little bit different. Um, there is a portion of the $1.9 trillion that's dedicated to, it, they're calling it low income water assistance program. So if there has been um, a decrease in revenues or rate paying um, revenues received in the water facility that possibly could be recouped in the low income water facility that's been created through ARPA. Um, so there are other circumstances where you may want to consider, I don't know how, um, how the water authority might be set up and if, if it is a political subdivision of the community or if it's run by the community itself. Um, yeah, that system might be eligible for the for the rate replacement in that LIHEAP program. Uh, I, I, I used an acronym, the Low Income Water Assistance Program. 
Um, so I think there's a lot of reasons to kind of start moving down the path of what else is there because you sure would like to free up these funds to be used for other things, right? <laughs> I think that's the key thing here is that you're looking outside of that $350 billion and that, that, that low income water assistance program might actually be covered in $1.9 trillion. In addition to what I would say too, there's a fair amount of money for hospitals and healthcare facilities inside of the $1.9 trillion. It flows through another secretariat, the HHS secretariat. Um, so the, the nursing facility may also receive some, some kind of assistance through other parts of this program. So definitely worth thinking about. Um, and maybe um, what I can do is point you out, point, point, point out those specific areas uh, for you and send that through Ms. Floor as well for distribution to this committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Tudor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, Ms. Brock, thank you very much for this great presentation. My question goes back to the eligibility uses that you talked about. As you can imagine, the state of New Hampshire's uh, meals and roads tax has taken a significant revenue hit because of the lack of tourism and travel in the state. Are you saying that, that some of that might be recoverable through this act? Yes. Um, so, so one of the things is um, uh, obviously an eligible use category A. They say very specifically that um, these expenditures can be based specifically on COVID-19 or a negative economic impact of COVID-19. For example, in communities where housing, uh, I'm sorry, hospitality and tourism are relied on. So, so it could be specifically that you are using these funds for those communities purposes specifically. But then you're also kind of talking about eligible use category C, which is that revenue replacement category. If in those communities, they had a booked loss of revenue based on, let's say it's meal taxes or hotel taxes, um, there was a booked loss in 2020. What they're trying to say in eligible use category C is that you recognize that booked loss and you replenish those revenues with these monies. Yeah. And so that that is a that is um, Congress trying to satisfy one of the biggest challenges that all the communities across the country were saying is we lost a lot of revenue. We need to be able to use these funds to replace those revenues. Um, and we fully expect for the communities, especially in the housing and hospitality, I'm sorry, the hospitality and tourism areas to be leaning heavily on the eligible use category C to recoup those revenues from the book loss last year. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Representative Elmy. Thank you. Just a clarification of that. Uh, our rooms and meals tax is state level and the communities only get a little of it back in revenue sharing. Uh, and it's not according to whether you, you need it or not in terms of tourism or generated it. Um, if we have at the state level, uh, is this revenue replenishment based on the, the net loss across the state budget, or is it based on, on you lost money in travel and tourism, but you gained money back in high level business taxes? Yeah, I think that's that, that yes, that's a question that um, we're trying to press treasury to be very specific on. And, and I use the metaphor of the zoo so let's say um, instead of the zoo, let's use it on, on meals taxes um, that goes to the state. Uh, it's, it's important that New Hampshire doesn't have just one number. You're not a monolith. You have, you have what's called fund accounting. You have a book loss over in the meals taxes while you may not have incurred a loss over in property tax collection, for example. We want for the treasury to allow for that book loss in the meals taxes to be, be, be um, exclusively a number that you can report back to treasury so that you can use that to replenish whatever else um, is going on across the enterprise. It's like the zoo or like the port. Those types of facilities lost a lot of money last year, but you may not have lost money in other categories. We want to make sure that we can classify that book loss specifically in its own operation to treasury when we certify the proceeds. 
it's 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 complicated, but I, <laughs> you know, we're we're hoping for more clarity as quickly as possible. And when you get this clarity, um, would you be willing to come back to us? Of course, I'd be delighted. Yes. Well, thank you. And I think you we've run out of time because it is now twenty after ten, and we're scheduled for an hour. And we certainly thank you, uh, Ms. Brock's excellent presentation. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Now the uh, for the committee. For tomorrow, I had put a placeholder in, but it looks like at this point in time, we won't need to use that placeholder tomorrow. So we will not be meeting in the morning at 9 o'clock. Uh, for the Republicans, we're going to have a caucus at 1.30 today. Because of, I told you uh, yesterday a different time, but because uh, we have to jump off from this and get into the chair, vice chair meeting that's going on right now. And so at 1.30, we'll have uh, a Republican caucus. All right. Any Further question, Representative Almy. I think Representative Tucker had her hand up first. Representative Tucker. Thank you very much. Yes, I just would like to know how we can make it possible for people in our county to see the recording. Could uh, Jennifer Four send us the way that someone could link in to the recording of this meeting? And that's what I was going to ask Jen to. Uh, Sure. Absolutely. I'll send the YouTube link, um, which will be generated after the meeting concludes. So I'll follow up um, later this morning with the link that you can share. That would be great. And I think that the people will probably also want to be able to print the uh, slides. So if you could have a separate um, way to those same people, we could send that on to them. That would be great. Absolutely. Thank Put them both much. in one email and we can just forward it. Mm -hmm. I will do that. I would recommend that you encourage your board of selectmen or city councilors or county commissioners to watch this. Yes, I think uh, probably some of the most useful work we do for them this year. Thank you. Okay. But now, Representative Elmy. Thank you. My question got answered. So now all I have to do is uh, remind the, the Democrats on, we have a caucus right after this on if uh, Representative Gord can send out the link again to the people that tend to lose it. Uh, that would be great. I don't think we should have to take very much time for it. But we got something from Representative Ames this morning. Oh, uh, we did? Is that for a different link? That was a mistake. Ignore oh. <laughs> I have mine red flagged and everything. <laughs> okay, are we all set? Then, Thank uh, thanks, everybody. I thought this morning was very beneficial for us and for our state. And thank you, Ms. Four. All right. We're going to leave.